Warning, the following contains explicit language and subject matter that may not be suitable for younger listeners, church folk, and people who enjoy kale smoothies. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to A Pot Amongst Men. I'm your host, Steve B., and this is Coffee Break Conversations for the 21st Century. So we're back. My guest today is a good friend of mine. It's been a long time coming. Finally got him on the show. My friend Max B., he's, uh, he's going to tell us about his wonderful journey through Europe and all the assorted continents he's been on, lived on, yeah, you know, done debauchery on, all that good stuff. He's a good friend of mine. You know, me and Max go back a long way, so I'm I'm really happy to have him here finally. He's a funny dude, very unique individual. But without further ado, here is Max B. All right, so do you want to give uh, like a little intro kind of to, as to who you are? We all know this is the uh, the glorious Max B, the, the vodka czar. <laughs> when did I get that title? I don't know. I just made it up right now on the spot. I like it. It's not bad, right? Sounds I quite well earned. Well, I mean, as far as people I know that I associate with, I think it's pretty fairly earned. Okay, fair enough. In my in the circles that I move in, you know. Fair enough. Relative to the group that we are familiar with. Yes. Okay. So, Max, who the hell are you? My name is Max. Mm. And give him full names. Okay. I was just going to say Max B, but there you go. Oh, then edit it out. <laughs> All right. There's going to be a little beep there. My name is Max B. <laughs> Steve and I, we've known each other since what? Sixth grade? Seventh grade? I believe seventh. It was like that. Mr. Sharp's class. How do you remember that? Dude, you know, I, I just have a really good memory for names and, and, like, words. I can't remember numbers and dates and stuff, but anything involving words and names, I, I got it. Like a good steel trap. You. Good for you. Like, even all of high school for me is kind of a blur. Anything before that is virtually non-existent, except for, like, the five people that I've kept in touch with since. Anyway, no you since sixth grade, apparently. Seventh, seventh, come on. Seventh. Keep up. Keep up. Excuse me. Excuse me. Hey, do me a favor. Shift your uh, computer over a little bit so you're like center of the frame. Hey, there he is. All right, beautiful. Thank you. Um, originally, I was, I am from Baku, Azerbaijan, which is where I was born. Um, so before you go past that, uh, you were born in Azerbaijan? Azerbaijan. Uh, say it again. Am I saying it wrong? Yes, you are. Okay. Azerbaijan. 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 Yeah. Azerbaijan. It helps if you do it. Azerbaijan. This, yeah. Okay. The hand yeah. motion. I should know, as being Italian, that's, you know. Yeah, but you guys do this. You My, do this, this. this. Yeah. Okay. Your question about Azerbaijan? So you were born there. When did you come to the U.S.? Uh, so I was born there, mid-80s, left there for Russia, 89. Um, at the time, it was still the Soviet Union. So mm -hmm. being from one area to another was fairly easy. And then 91, that's when the Soviet Union decided to start collapsing, which is when my family came here as uh, refugees, basically. Well, how much of that time period do you remember? Like, I know you said everything before sixth grade is a blur, but surely there has to be some... Oh, that part I remember quite a bit of. What was it like? Because now, you know, like I said, on many episodes before, my wife and her family are from Cuba, and they, they left, they escaped communism. Uh, yeah. Obviously, they came here legally, but... Um... You know, they they have quite a f quite a few stories to share about it, and uh, yeah, you know, what's your what's your experience been like as far as you can remember? Um, well, at the time, I'm 
let me just make it clear that I'm also prefacing this with a lot of information that I've learned, you know, obviously since mm -hmm. and of college. Um, at the time in 89, um, a lot of the outskirts of the Soviet Union, the republics, they were experiencing a lot of ethnic violence and ethnic cleansing. It's a very polite most way people, to put it. Most people are used to hearing about ethnic cleansing or ethnic violence in terms of either the Holocaust or Rwanda. Mm -hmm. It was very much happening in the late 80s, early 90s, throughout much of the Southern Soviet Union, actually in the, in the Western Soviet Union too. So places like Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, places that you really wouldn't think of as having that kind of problem so recently. Uh, for anybody not totally clear on what that would entail, could you kind of elaborate on what exactly you mean by ethnic cleansing? Um, so throughout the entire period of the Soviet Union, a lot of the um, communist governments were set up based on the ethnicity that a certain someone is. So ethnicity, interestingly enough, not really not really established in the US. So mm -hmm. here it's kind of, it's equivalent to how in the US you think along racial lines. Over there, it was more about ethnicity and nationality. Mm -hmm. So like, like a Greek is a Greek. It's someone who was born in Greece, who has Greek parents, who is Greek Orthodox by religion. And it was very much kind of established the same way in the Soviet Union. And as a matter of fact, um, the Soviet Union was in many cases divided up amongst small republics, smaller republics, to put little enclaves of Armenians or Serbs or Ukrainians or whoever else in majority other ethnic populations to sort of keep the local tensions up. And then the way they would suppress those tensions is by kind of making Russian the the standard ethnic, mm -hmm. the standard language across the board. So when the Soviet Union started to collapse and the you know, kind of monolithic presence of Russia started to lessen and lessen, all of those ethnic tensions that had been bottled up for over a hundred years at that point, because like most of most of what we think of as the Soviet Union, if you just look at a map, most of that area had been under 400 years of essentially Russian control. And it was built that way for a purpose. And imagine like overnight, you have yeah. Russia's gone all of a sudden, and you have all these ethnic tensions back in play. And it boiled over when the Soviet Union had collapsed and a lot of these countries not knowing what was going to happen to them. Were they going to be like individual states? Were they going to be a part of Russia? Were they like what was going on with them? They decided, many of them, that they wanted to be ethnically pure. So in my case, they didn't want Armenians to be in Azerbaijan and they didn't want Azerbaijanis to be in Armenia, despite the fact that just from a cultural and ethnic point of view, you had many Azerbaijanis who had lived their entire lives and generations, really. Mm -hmm. Armenia spoke Armenian, knew the customs, knew the culture, had For, never been to Azerbaijan, never spoken the language. Yeah, effectively are Armenian at that point. Yeah, well, by by virtually every other definition. Yeah. And so all of a sudden they were basically so they were basically told you have to leave because you're in Azerbaijan, you have to go to Azerbaijan. And um very similar to our current president telling people they need to go back to Mexico when they've never been there. You know what I mean? If you can relate that to Today. Yeah, let, let, let's let's not tug at the thread of the current president because yeah, we, we won't get into that. Down but... A deep, dark, and violent spiral. <laughs> Just to kind of give some folks a frame of reference, because I know not myself included, not all of us are as uh, 
as educated as as you in terms of world history and politics? Um. So that was per- so that was pretty much the basis of my family having to leave Azerbaijan. Okay. The reason why a lot of people were there, not just from Armenia or from Azerbaijan or from Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, even Russians, really. Um, because in the south of Russia, where like the Soviet control was a little less, um, cities like Odessa, Baku, Kiev, they were thought of as being more open. So there was more like Western influence coming in. Okay. Um, so a lot of people flock to those cultural centers and there a lot of them were economic powerhouses at the time. So Baku especially was particularly known for, you know, the, the economic advantage of having the oil well, um, just being a good tropical spot because it's right on the Caspian Sea. So it was a lot more open. There was a lot more availability. So and now... Parents, my dad was really into the Beatles, and the Beatles were readily available in Baku. But you were born in Baku. I was born in Baku. And you guys left there to go to Russia because you were of Russian descent? So my mom is Armenian. Okay. My dad is Russian, mostly. Okay. Long story short, I had a Russian last name. Like, we all had a Russian last name, so it made the most sense because that was the one place in the Soviet Union at the time that was not experiencing ethnic unrest. Gotcha. All right, so you went there, and then in 91, you came to the U.S. So 91 is when Gorbachev opened up the borders and said... You guys have, anyone who wants to leave, you have a 15-day period in which you need to identify a country, get your stupid visas, and go. No hunting, no, no, no KGB coming after you, nothing. Find a place and go. Um, my dad at the time, he had gone to literally every European embassy that was still open to taking... Not a single one was really open at that point. The only country that was still accepting refugees was the Soviet U- was well was the U.S. Okay. So you guys, did you have any like family or relatives over here? Nope. So, I guess ninety one. You were six, seven, ish. We were both born in eighty four. So that I know of. Yeah. yeah. Um. What was that like as a, as a little kid? Do you recall? Like, was there, I mean, was it exciting? Was it scary? Like, did, how would you describe it? Uh, I mean, I had gotten, I don't know. I, was, I guess at that point I was like pretty numb. I didn't know what the hell was going on. So like, you know, we left Baku by airplane and you know, there were missiles being lobbed at us from boats and like surface to air missiles. And they were like blowing up on either side of us. They were trying to shoot down planes because they knew that refugees were leaving. Yeah, of course. I mean, that's, I could see how that would be. Yeah, make natural you stuff, you know, just the way it works. <laughs> have you taken, have you ever taken off in LaGuardia? Jesus. <laughs> um, so. Yeah, like, I definitely remember the whole war situation, the tanks rolling in, the, you know, airplanes and people being gunned down. So, like, when we were leaving, this other thing started happening of, you know, missiles being lobbed at the plane. I didn't know what the hell was going on. I was sitting on somebody's lap. I forget. I don't remember whose. And um, we got to Russia. We had some family in Russia. But at that point, when we had gotten to Russia, we spent like a year or so there staying with people. Mm-hmm. But at that point, it became pretty obvious that it's collapsing. Like, yeah. it's, this isn't some kind of struggle. This, this thing is collapsing. It's go time. <laughs> the Soviet Union is not going to reconstitute itself. And that's when Gorbachev said, okay, 
I don't know what the hell is going on, but anyone who wants to leave can leave. So when we came to the U.S., mind you, like the U.S. was one, the enemy. <laughs> Two, um, you only heard about it in terms of like being this thing over there that nobody knows about. Kind so, of like, only see it through that lens yeah. of, you know, the Cold War. Not so much the Cold War. At that point, like, detente had kicked in, and, you know, there was less of a thing about, you know, they're going to kill us and blow ourselves up. But um, there was a lot of mythology about Americans. So, for instance, um, Americans don't eat bread. Well, I can attest to that being completely false. Americans are so prudish that they showered with their underwear on. <laughs> no joke. I'm not even kidding about that one. It was the weirdest thing ever. <laughs> I mean, depending on where you go. Yeah, but at the same time, there was this sort of um, fascination in a lot of Russia, a lot of the Soviet Union, really, about the U.S. So, for instance, you know, movies would get broadcast on occasion. U.S. movies like Terminator, I think I saw in the Soviet Union at one point. <laughs> um, there was, at the time, one McDonald's in Moscow in Gorky Park. And there was, it was famous for having like a line that stretched all the way around the whole block just to get into them. In fact, people used to use like the paper um, front try holders they were collectibles. Like people would bring them home and they would put napkins into them as napkin holders. And that would be like a conversation piece amongst people to be like, oh, I've been to the McDonald's. <laughs> it's kind of like the way every Chick fil A is, you know, in America right now. You can't go without the line being down the road. And, you know, I don't if, get it. I don't know. I don't think it's. I don't think it's. If you're fun. into that LGBTQ anti LGBTQ flavored chicken, <laughs> yeah. it's funny how some people could put that aside for some some good chicken. Something something about the bigotry just makes it taste better. I'm just saying it's not all that great. I agree. I mean, and that, first of all, that's not my line. I stole that from Corey Ryan Forrester, but that is. Uh, <laughs> yeah, shout out! Shout out to Corey. Um. <laughs> um so yeah, okay. So you came here. Pop I, I you know, I actually agree. I agree. So but back to uh immigrating to the US or you being a refugee as you put it. Uh you I, you didn't speak any English before you came here, right? Nope. Nope. In fact, in Moscow <clears throat> um we used to live in a suburb of Moscow. By the way, when I say when I say suburb of Moscow, I mean two hours out by train. Jesus, that was still a suburb. In a suburb called Mitsisha. and um, yeah, by that logic, uh, you know, I live in a summer a suburb of Philadelphia. Yeah, or New York for that matter. Oh, yeah, but I have a two hour radio, a two hour span that I could kind of fit wherever I want to. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> By Moscow standards, you probably live in a suburb of D.C. Um, no, it was it was huge because there was like these regions called oblasts that were considered part of Moscow. Whatever. With the apartment we were living in at one point, I remember when my dad came home knowing that we were moving to the U.S. He came home with like an envelope full of dollar bills, like different denominations. And we were all like looking at them like, Ooh, this is weird money. Cause like the dollars were like this size, but rubles were like this size. They were like fairly yeah, right. sized currency. And you know, most of it was coins at the time. I still have some somewhere. Um, and we were just like sitting on a windowsill and my dad was trying to teach me like random words for the things that were happening on the street. So I, I'm pretty sure my first word in English was bus. The second word was sky. Okay. And I don't remember the other ones. Well, you got a pretty firm grasp of the language now. I do. Thank yeah. you. 
Hats off, sir. Hats off to you. Thank you, Mrs. Packer. <laughs> Who's Mrs. Packer? Uh, the English teacher that they had set us up with. So I came here, like the family came here under a program. Mm -hmm. And my family was um, particularly welcome because they had two young male sons that would, you know, serve the propaganda machine well if it was still needed. Mm. Because like, oh, look at these poor Soviet children that became American men. Just wait till they get to military age. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. All was, right. I'm, I'm sure there were like other intentions, but like, all right, whatever. Let's just get here. Hey, I always thought it was weird, though, considering as many people as I know that English wasn't their first language. Like some people never really lose an accent. Like with you, it's not even detectable at all, like even by listening carefully. And I'm pretty good at that. It's not there at all. Whereas somebody like our friend Louis, I feel like English kind of was his first language, and he has an accent for some reason. It's slight, but it's there. Um. So they, one of the aspects of the program was to Americanize us as much as possible. Unfortunately, no one really told the former Immigration and Naturalization Service, now part of Department of Homeland Security, that Slavs and Eastern Europeans learn phonetically, not grammatically. So we learn by hearing things. I don't know. It's just the way the language is set up. Because, mm -hmm. you know, there's like 29 letters in the Russian alphabet. Six of them are just sounds. Like, they're, they're not letters that you would just say. They're, they're sounds that you make in a word. Like, describe that. I'm, I'm having a... What do you mean, like, it's just a sound? A letter is essentially just a sound, right? Well, a letter, by definition, is a symbol for a sound. Okay. Whereas in the Russian alphabet, in the Cyrillic alphabet, there are letters or groups of letters that form just a sound that, like, there's one that, there are three of them, at least, that I know offhand. Um, that's like it, it. You literally say when you're reciting the alphabet, "mahki znak, tvrdy znak," which means hard sound, soft sound. And if you see it at the end of a letter, at the end of a word, you know how to finish that word correctly. But the one that throws Americans off the most, and I'm going to scare the hell out of you, is. There is a sound, and I think it's like the third or fourth letter from the end of the Russian alphabet. It looks like a lowercase b and a lowercase l. And you'll see, if you ever look at a pictograph of it, it's, it's a pair of skis. And the way you say skis in Russian is luzhi. And that lowercase b and that lowercase l makes the sound ui. <laughs> it's part of the alphabet <laughs> okay i mean after being being in france oui. and, and trying attempting to learn a little french like on the spot that is not the strangest thing i've heard the french like the french language really threw me for a loop so and i feel like russian isn't that bad <laughs> okay <laughs> not that i'm gonna go you know suddenly take up russian lessons it's bad enough. I told my father-in-law I was voting for Bernie Sanders, and now he thinks I'm a communist. So now the next thing I know, I'm going to come home learning Russian. And he's like, that's it. We're moving back to Miami. <laughs> and now you're talking about the Soviet Union on your podcast. How's it feel there, Pinko? <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm going to grow a little like, uh, what's that guy's name? Uh, we were just watching that, that movie about Frida Kahlo, and there was a a character is a real life a real life person. I can't remember his name now, so I just completely blew the joke. Uh it was a famous communist and a communist thinker. Guy got uh assassinated. Ah, he's friends with Frida Kahlo. Why can't I think of the name? Just friends with a lot of communists. I'm uh, yeah, clearly. You're not talking about Che, are you? No, 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 no. Um 
think he was a Russian guy. Jeffrey Rush played him in the movie. Either way, totally irrelevant. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so let's fast forward. So you grew up here. You picked up the language. You got it down. You graduated with me. Took a little while to get it down. How long did it take? Six months to start speaking the language. Six months from the time that I was introduced to an English teacher to the time that I was able to speak it in any way. And no joke for those six months, I didn't say anything in English. <laughs> Pre-first grade. This is when I had my meetings with Mrs. Packer. And um, again, no one told them that Russians and Slavs learn phonetically. So... <laughs> Um, she had like this weird British Aussie accent. I wasn't quite sure. But at the end of those six months, I had it too. And I remember the INS guy had come in to like inspect my English. And he heard me speaking with this weird European accent. And he's just like, no, that won't do. <laughs> so it was just a matter of like finding something to teach me the accent. And of all things, it was the cartoon Garfield. My son loves it. You do kind of have a Garfield uh, delivery a little bit. The sarcasm, the dry. The sarc time, yeah, all of the it. The weird love of lasagna. Yeah, it was Garfield all the way. Now that you've said it, I, I feel like I can't unsee it. Glass shattered. Oh, boy. Uh, like you're you're rethinking our whole friendship right now. No, I mean, it's... We've it, been friends with Russian Garfield. <laughs> It's the least surprising thing ever. Like I'm like, oh well, that that completely checks out. That all makes sense. <laughs> the weird thing is though, like we've always referred to you as Russian, like all of our friends, our group, even yourself. And technically, yeah. you're only like, like vaguely Russian. I'm only a quarter Russian. So why don't you just you don't just say I'm? Well, will you be Armenian? And then what's the yeah. rest? You said your dad was Russian, your mom was Armenian. If you're only my mom is a hundred percent Armenian, my dad okay. is half Russian. The other half are no one's quite sure, but we're pretty sure Ahmed was an Iranian. <laughs> Everyone likes to say that he was from Dagestan, but I'm like, sorry, kids. At some point, we got to talk about the the complexion. <laughs> Ahmed is not from Dagestan. <laughs> I feel like a lot of uh, some, well, some people's families, specifically mine, uh, nobody really knows. Nobody at least can agree on what exactly we are. At first, we were part, we were Polish, and then we were Polish and German, and then we were all kinds of things. And everybody has a different answer. So people say, "What are you?" And I just kind of, I say what feels the easiest to me. Well, I mean, it'll always depend on when your family came over or when like parts of your family came over. Like, it's interesting. You, you hear people refer to themselves as Austrian and I'm like, how far back? Oh, six generations. So you're, a, you're a Habsburg. Like you're going to call yourselves a Habsburg. Oh, Jesus Christ. Sorry. That cord got caught. Um, no. Yeah. I don't know. I was going to do like a 23 and me thing, but I was like, who really cares? Does it make a difference? Well, 23 and me, you're looking at um, more like genetic stuff like, well, I mean, yeah, they'll look at genetic stuff, but they can actually give you like some idea of if you have distant cousins out there. Like, yeah. I, I did the thing that all of the current ones are based on. That was the National Geographic Genographic Project, the very, very first like DNA sampler thing that did it. And I knew it was like I knew it couldn't tell me anything remarkable about the past, because mm -hmm. I'm like, I know where I'm from. Like that whole region is basically step three out of Africa. <laughs> but it was able to tell me like where my ancestors went to. <laughs> See, that's what I want to know. I want to know like... like, yeah. So. Oh. I actually predate the guy who is considered the first human, the first male. What do you mean you ha ha what do you mean you predate the, the first like I was 
first human. So all of every, anyone who is of European descent and anyone who is of Native American descent, they all descend from one guy in Central Asia, in present day Kazakhstan. Oh. Like all have the same marker. We're all a distant cousin of Borat. I date that guy. <laughs> well, that's a, I'm sure that's a, a great icebreaker in the bars. That, yeah, uh, that's a great icebreaker in the Philippines. <laughs> My ancestor helped you guys out. You're welcome. <laughs> so anyway, I do feel... I know it's always in the, been in the back of my head for as long as we've been friends and that I've known anything about you, really, is that I, myself, always call you Russian. And it's, it kind of, it always felt slightly wrong, you know? Even though Why? you, I don't know, because you're not really, you're less Russian than you are Armenian. Yeah, but I'm still a Russian. My last name is Russian. I speak Russian. It's fine. And besides, white Russians. I play Russian roulette. The first one isn't true. White Russians are disgusting. All that milk. One is good. Especially if you're a fan of uh, the Big Lebowski as I am. Fair enough. And Russian roulette. You, uh, you tell me there's some truth to that one? <clears throat> I did live in Brooklyn for a time. <laughs> With the rest of us, Russian. With the rest of the Russians, some wild nights out in Coney was, Island, huh? It was my turn. <laughs> we, played, um, we played a new form of Russian roulette. We passed around six girls, and one of them had a had a UTI. Uh, no, it wasn't like a real game of Russian roulette, but it was definitely like a weird chambered water gun with like a bit of vodka in it. I'm like, where did you people even get this shit? Like, how does it exist? Why do you have a water gun revolver that has like pellets or like little capsules of vodka? But a better question is why don't we have one? I don't know, but I didn't want to relive that night, so that bad. Oh, it was a great night. Oh, I was gonna say surely can't be anything like uh, going to the the Bulgarian club that you took me to or, or wherever that was. Was it Bulgarian? Which one? All I know is at one point the, uh, there was like a large group of like uh, Indian men and they started playing some song that was like popular with them and they were out there wrist dancing and everything. But it was not the... You Okay, now uh, our, I see the light bulb. The, the hookah place? No, it was, it was in the village, if I recall correctly. But it was not the hookah place. The hookah place was on Bleecker Street. That's yeah. not what I'm talking about. Uh, I took you to a place where they played Indian music? Well, it wasn't an Indian club. It's just this one, they played one song. It was an Indian song. And there was a, a group of guys. That, was it for my birthday? Was it one of my birthday things? Uh, I want to say it was, it might have been. No, it was, it was your birthday. It was. It may have been. I don't know, man. I, a don't, lot I don't remember. Kind of blurs. All I remember is we stayed with Rachel. That was when she was living in Harlem at the time. Either way, we'll, we'll sit here all night trying to remember this shit. So we're going to fast it's forward. A, it's a lot of nights to go through in New York. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, we're going to fast uh, forward. So yeah. you went to college in Switzerland. I did. I've been there. It's an amazing place. Yeah, why don't you talk about that? <laughs> well, I could I could give the listeners a bit of a in my experience with it. We went there in 2015 for your alumni event. Now, I'm halfway I'm halfway sure that there was at least a few people that thought that I was like your your partner. But Oh yeah. Yeah, it was whatever, but it was it was cool. <laughs> I mean, I was single at the time, so I had no commitments to do anything else. And you finally were, you know, after all these years of trying to get me to go to Europe, you said, "All right, I'm going. Are you going to come?" And I said, "Fuck yes." So, you know, in, uh, interestingly enough, Louis's dad actually paid for my travel. 
I had to do a side job at his house, and that job paid for the trip for me. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. I, but, uh, that's that sounded a little porny there for a moment. I know, right? Like, no. what did you do for money? You couldn't have been <laughs> yeah. that desperate. I use my trade, sir. No shame in it. Got you. Got you to Lugano. There you go. But anyway, <laughs> yeah. So anybody not familiar with Switzerland, it is a uh, a very small country in Europe. It is bordered by. Italy, Germany, France, and Austria, if I'm correct? Um, Italy, France, Germany, Germany, Austria, and Liechtenstein. That's right. I left that one out. I thought it was only four. But uh, we stayed, or your school, Franklin, Franklin University, it's in Lugano in the south of Switzerland, uh, very yep. close to the Italian border. It's kind of buried in the the canton the cantons is that how canton. you pronounce them which is yeah. like the valleys around the alps and it's uh it's, no no the, the cantons are like they're the version of states in switzerland oh okay so i explained that wrong either way so you're looking at big mountains and then you have these like valleys with these beautiful lakes and there's palm trees and it's you're seeing snow-capped mountains and somehow it's sunny and nice which was very lovely and max took me there everybody spoke italian in that place and uh but either way why don't you explain to me how you decided on franklin what how did you even hear about that school what made you want to go to school abroad you know for abroad for us at least well first of all i want to comment on your coming to lugano and just watching your face sink in disbelief at the fact that you couldn't quite piece together at that point why living in Lugano was so fantastic. And then just like, just watching your heart drop. Watching it slowly dawn on me after the course of a week. Oh no, pretty much right away. (laughs) I remember, I remember because we were on the Malpensa Express going from the airport in Milan to Lugano. And I know exactly the moment when to look at someone to get their reaction because it's the, it's where the the mountain on the right side stops, and then you like as soon as it stops, you see the lake, you see like the city, it's all right there. And I I remember telling you like just just look to the right over there, see how you feel, <laughs> and then just watching your face like <gasps> like get all. all right, I wasn't like that. Yes, exaggerating. It was. I mean, it was gorgeous. It is gorgeous, <laughs> and I, I want to go back. But uh, that really, for me, that trip was the start of my wanting to go to Europe and see different places and leave the U.S. And if I go on a vacation, I don't want to go on a vacation within the United States. I want to go see somewhere I've never seen before. Oh, come so, on, there's plenty of good stuff in the U.S. I'm not saying there's not. I'm just saying for me personally, I want to. I've been to a lot of places in the U.S. I've only been to a handful outside the U.S. You know, and yeah. it all started with yeah. that trip. Good man. So yeah, how did you decide on Franklin? Uh, how did I decide on Franklin? Well, do you remember when we had to take those annoying ass questionnaires whenever we did those? whatever standardized tests were called. Yeah, vaguely when they asked, like, what you're interested like, in. Like, what are you that... interested in? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And at that point, I don't know, I was gravitating towards political science. Not hard to believe. <laughs> yeah. um, but really, I definitely remember ending high school by saying, I want to see the world. Like, I want to travel the world. Mm -hmm. and I don't mean like let me be a geography major and a cartographer and like draw other places in the world like I want to go see the world and so I got a brochure from Franklin which I freely admit and you can use this as one of my embarrassing things it took me a little while to figure out that it was actually in Switzerland like I just thought it was like a Swiss school in the US somewhere oh um, it's not I got bad. for sure. It was telling me about the courses. It was telling me about the majors. It was telling me about the academic travel component, which um, is amazing. <laughs> yeah. um, 
and then, you know, you do a little research and you, you realize like, you know, people who do like a semester, just one semester abroad for college are six times more likely to get hired for a job. People who do an entire year abroad are eight times more likely. So you definitely, when you got to look at some of the data, you realize like exposure counts. Yeah. And not in terms of like, oh, let me join student government on campus or something. Like, go out there, go see it. Like, do it on your own. Well, I mean, I even in daily life, talking to people who've actually gotten to experience different cultures, different environments, just been outside of that little bubble that they're used to and their their own little, you know, area that they grew up in, just getting outside of that and seeing that you know the the world is a lot bigger than than just your hometown yeah. those people i feel like have a much uh healthier perspective on just the world and everything we do it's just on life in general which sounds it, you know it it's like a cliche you know there's always the people mm-hmm. like oh you you have to go to europe you have to go to stad you have to you have to go overseas and it, it kind of like <laughs> <laughs> you must, Stephen. You must go to Stad. <laughs> but you you know the type I'm talking about, where it's yeah. almost like a like a snobbiness about them. But, douches. We can just call them douches. Yeah. F- fucking like douchebags. I'm a, I'm a pretty experienced traveler, and anyone can be a very good experienced traveler without turning into a douche. Yes. Anyone who goes out of their way to talk about it, which I freely admit that I definitely had at some point, you can talk about your experiences without being a douche about it. You can, you know, just sharing an interesting story, Mm -hmm. giving people some advice, some ideas where to go. No, I I agree because it's it's just, it's so eye-opening, especially when you really... You're not just going there to like the tourist spots like, oh, I went to Madrid and I went to, you know, Sagrada Familia and then I had tapas and I went home. Like, no, you're not experiencing the culture of a place. So, So I will say that I am very glad that your first European experience was in a place like Lugano. Mm hmm. It's not a big city. It doesn't have tourist traps like you wouldn't set foot in Lugano unless you knew to go there with someone who can like show you around and, you know, just, just tell you about like, here's what the piazza, here's what this thing is about. Mm -hmm. Here are these like very specific kind of neighborhoods. They're called, you know, Quartiera Maghetti, Quartiera this or that. And, you know, it, it has this feel or that feel, you know, you didn't go to a tourist place. Well, I think that that, left a a very specific taste in my mouth where it was I wanted to I mean not not that I I completely want to stay away from those because there are some places that are definitely worth going for sure for sure yeah but it definitely that was that being my first impression of you know life outside the U.S. or specifically in Europe it was uh it's like yeah no you have to go experience the stuff not the stuff that all the the travel brochures want you to see like see what it's really like, you know, just go walk around, go get lost in the middle of the night, you know, around Lake Lugano (laughs) and try to find your way back to the hotel (laughs) after being Uh, embarrassingly drunk at a nightclub with people you don't know. I still have that picture somewhere. Oh God! I I want you to know it's going to, it's going to prop, it's going to come up as my background at some point. You, Eh, it's okay. Wasn't the worst picture. It was a great picture. Hey, listen, it was a picture for anybody uh, listening, it was a picture of me drunk in this nightclub with Max chugging a bottle of champagne. God, they gave us a lot of champagne bottles that night. That was what did it for me. That, that got right on top of me. Because <laughs> I have that I have that thing that it, part of my personality where when I get drunk, if I suddenly get this, like, I get like a feeling like, oh, I should probably leave. No, I need to leave right now. And then, like, that's the only thing in my mind. I, I need to leave for no apparent reason, but it's just because it got in my head somehow. And that's what yeah. happened that night. Which is terrible. We were dancing. We were having a great time. 
I know. I think I think I like embarrassed myself in front of somebody. I'm not 100 percent sure what it was. Oh, the the Arab girl. <laughs> oh yeah. Ah, oh. yeah, that was embarrassing. <laughs> that in fact, I'll save that. That'll be my embarrassing story for the episode. It's not embarrassing. It's a little embarrassing. It's a little embarrassing. Oh, you thought she wanted to hook up, but she didn't. She just wanted to like have a good time. No, that's not even it. Oh. Well, we'll get there. We'll get there. We'll get there. I don't remember. I just remember like you left and I was like, I'll be concerned friend for 30 seconds. <laughs> yeah. Okay. He's gone. I'm getting back to it. <laughs> yeah. But hey, I mean, I've, I found my way back. I'm good. I'm good with directions. <laughs> you saved me the search. <laughs> well, what was your plan? Like if you got back to the hotel and I wasn't there, you were going to, then... <laughs> I freely admit, and I'm happy to call myself a terrible friend in that instance, but I was, I was like, no, I'm going to go. I'm going to stay out. I'm going to keep dancing. I'm going to keep drinking. Diogo kept bring, not Diogo, Beppe kept bringing like more champagne bottles afterwards. <laughs> I'm like this is why i mean i'll drink them but why <laughs> um and i just remember like forcing myself to stay out longer and keep dancing and then i remember it was like 4 a.m 4 5 a.m like the sun was definitely coming up and i was like oh sunrise over lake lugano this is familiar <laughs> not much has changed in like 10 years <laughs> but i remember like deliberately forcing myself to stay out because i'm like if I go back to the hotel and this son of a bitch is not there and I have to traipse around Lugano looking for his corpse or something, it will ruin my weekend. I'm going to freak right out. <laughs> I'm going to freak right out. But hey, I took care of it. You, I, yep, I got to the hotel room and your ass was passed out and snoring. Anyway, so Franklin... You decided to go to Franklin. You get to Switzerland. Describe what it was like. You, I mean, that wasn't. I mean, how much experience did you have aside from you know when you were young and in Russia and as a very, as very, very, very little. Okay. So the breadth of my experience. So prior to going to Franklin, I had been back to Russia twice just to see the family and mind you we go see the family back east and mind you that whole time like it it was it was degrading (laughs) like there was like russia was diminishing as a whole like this was Mm -hmm. before the economic resurgence so to speak this was when you know they had like six to eight zeros at the end of the currency like oh like honestly if you looked at some of the bills that we had to use at the time it was it was like zimbabwe dollars <laughs> it was ridiculous um so i remember i think it was like just before i went into or like i think after freshman year of high school maybe like my parents wanted to go visit the family there and we wanted to go visit my family, my cousins in France. Um, so we went to Russia, we went to France and my parents were, they were excited to have me kind of get that European experience. So that was pretty much the extent of it. You went to France, where did you go to Paris? Uh, no, actually Paris, I was only in for like three or four days. I am, having been to Paris now, I think, four, five times in my life. It's a beautiful city. I am not a fan of it, though. Nor am I. I think France, like, if you take Paris out of it, France would easily be my favorite country in Europe. (laughs) Because Strasbourg, Nice, Saint-Nazaire, amazing cities. Like, beautiful and amazing like stomach show just france if i get if anyone is listening and needs advice on france if you can skip paris and go to everywhere else do it yeah. work 
I feel like it's worth it to go to Paris once just to say you went. But you know what? Paris, I would say at most is a three day city. Yeah, no, that's it. You don't need any more. Anything like, more than that, you do, you're overdoing it. Like, you'll do the Latin Quarter, you'll do the Eiffel Tower, do the Louvre, do Napoleon's Tomb, do La Défense if you like really want to go in that direction. Go to the, the Montmartre. I don't know how to say that. Montmartre? Yeah, Montmartre. I don't know. Church. Yeah. The whole, that whole area by the Moulin Rouge, and you go up the hill where the, the Sacred Heart Church is. Yeah, yeah. That but, was nice, but... Like, really, you can do all of that in a good day and a half. Well, we had five days there, so we did three days in the city. One day we drove to Verdun. Vers- Versailles or Verdun? No, we, Versailles was a different day. Verdun, we drove all the way out there to meet my wife's okay. friend who lives in Germany in Worms. And they drove and met us there. It was kind of like the somewhat halfway well, point. Well done, by the way, pronouncing verbs correctly. Thank you. I thought, according to some people in my family, I'm part German, so. Arms. Anyway, but yeah, so we only really had three days in the city. I that mean, was enough. That was enough for me. Obviously, Paris, if you really want to go to Paris, like, I just don't think it's worth more than three days there. Like, you can see everything with plenty of time to spare in three days. And I, I just think there is so much of France that's worth seeing. You can see everything in two days. If you want to pack your schedule that much, but I will say, you know, you want to experience Paris a little more outside of the touristy places. Like, Listen, those people make fun of them, but those double-decker, like the, the sightseeing buses. The red cars. They're those amazing. Are, they're, they're fantastic. So there, it's, there it's are the smartest thing you could do if you're going to. A, I will say that there are like a handful of cities in Europe that are worth doing the red car with. Paris is one of them. Barcelona did it in Barcelona and Paris, and then I would say London, just because London is like spread out. Well, I have a place to stay in London now. Kid sister Lexi. Sister, sister. Yeah. yeah. You know she had Corona. I have so many people now who are like, oh, yeah, I had Corona. Yeah. She, I mean, she's, she's like good now. After, but... before we hung out. So I probably had Corona at some point. No, this was back in March. No, not not you. I'm talking about like me. Like right oh, now, oh, oh. <laughs> a lot of friends coming in who are like, oh, yeah, I had Corona, apparently. Great. <laughs> Thank uh, yeah. I don't know I, I, what you what do you, what do you want me to do about that situation? What am I supposed to do with this information? Um, okay, so we keep getting sidetracked. Yeah, we really really are. That's okay. Makes for a more interesting episode. So go on, man. I got nothing after this. Yeah, <laughs> and plenty of vodka. I'm still not a hundred percent on whether or not I'm going to work tomorrow. I'll decide. <laughs> I'll decide at around five fifteen a.m. I'll probably get to go, but I'd like to leave that option open. Makes me feel better. I was better about to say, life. are you planning on this going until five fifteen a.m.? I think nah, you we're not going to. Interesting. Yeah, no, we're, we're not going to go more than two hours anyway, and we're already at I, almost an hour. Keep going, my friend. I'm anyway, here. anyway, <laughs> so uh, Franklin, Franklin, you just got the Franklin. Now, was it anything like my you know eye opening experience? My first time. No, there. it was terrifying. Okay. It was absolutely terrifying. I remember driving to Newark Airport with my parents with a large suitcase, a giant cardboard box that I had like <laughs> sheets and crap in. And checked in. I was on the group flight, so um, the school arranges arranged for a group flight with new students who have committed early enough to go there. So mm-hmm. I don't know if you remember this, but I did the early acceptance thing. So I do remember that we were leaving. So I was leaving in August, but you had to commit by winter. What would have been our winter break in December? 
And I just remember I got the acceptance letter from Franklin like three weeks before the winter break. And I just remember bringing the letter with me to my teachers and just saying, listen, here it is. I'm in. I'm done. I just need to be. We're done here. <laughs> just, just tell me the bare minimums to get this B because high school's over for me. I'm rid of all you bastards. <laughs> like no one was surprised. No one was surprised. In fact, most of the teachers would like pull me aside and be like, I'm very glad you're doing this. You're taking this experience. I'm like, thank you. B. Now. <laughs> like, I'm not looking for, you know, guidance counselor number 14 here. Get me the grade. <laughs> um, it didn't quite sink in until I was actually in the car on the way to the airport. So I had the group flight. Some of the newer kids and I, we exchanged some email with emails here and there. But then I remember in the airport, I checked in, the bags were like, you know, being carted off. And I said goodbye to my parents and I was going into the security line at the airport. And I'm like, oh shit. I'm doing this. I'm moving to another country. Like not knowing when I would come back. Mm -hmm. I have no idea who's there. I don't speak the language. What am I doing? <laughs> I'm really in deep shit right now. <laughs> no, it wasn't even I'm not. Deep shit right now. I'm just like nervous. Yeah. According to my dear best friend, Jared, uh, who you, whom you've mm -hmm. met, apparently I started perspiring with, we'll just say great vigor. Because apparently that's the story that he tells about meeting me. Like, I was just sweaty. <laughs> um, and I'm like, all right, we're doing this. The funny thing about that was when we actually, when I got to the airport and all these other people were there. And it was just like, hey, we're going to be your friends from now on. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to be your friend from now on, too. And then we just got together, we got on the plane. Obviously it was an international flight on Swiss air. So of course we started drinking at the tender age of 17 or so. <laughs> <laughs> and I tell you that you have to go to a special level to get an international airline to cut you off. But they cut us off. <laughs> <laughs> like at some point they realized what was going on and like all these young kids were not just like on a field trip and like the at uh, the one adult who was with us was like a chaperone she didn't give a shit <laughs> and we were just all about the gin and tonics and the bloody marys jesus everyone drinks bloody marys on an airplane apparently cuz your taste buds alter with the pressure so you crave more like salty things Okay, I did not know that. Learn something new every day. Next thing you know, next thing you know, I'll be drinking grapefruit flavored seltzer water. Are you drinking non-alcoholic beverages with me? Uh, well, I have this. I still have the wine. Okay. All right. Point corked. taken. It's corked. Point taken. I am two with you, and plus another four drinks in. The least I can do is you've been so generous with your with your Tuesday night. Yeah. Salute. Uh, salute. All right. So let's just say it was an interesting flight over. Very interesting. We get to Zurich. Um, still with the same group of people. Like you just I definitely didn't realize what I was what I was getting myself into, but it turned out to be amazing. And so it's a 300 at the time, it was a 300 person school, 300 people max, including the new class, which is <laughs> insane. And by the time orientation had wrapped up, it was you realize that it was like 50% Americans and 50% everywhere else. So predominantly Arabs, Germans. Um, Shout out to Christoph. Christoph. 
The Germans. <laughs> the Germans. Uh, bless Snatch for introducing us to them. Ah, uh, <laughs> the Germans. How are you, Tommy? Um, Italians, obviously, like people from everywhere. Mm -hmm. Like, go oh, from Japan, a couple of kids from China. There was a lot of people from everywhere, and it was fantastic. It makes it more uh, interesting. And then on top of that, you had like all these other kids from everywhere else, sophomores, juniors, seniors, and you know, it, it was, it was a super friendly crowd and you knew immediately who was going to be part of the family. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, just in the few days that I was around the people that I met that were alumni, you know, classmates of yours, literally everyone was yeah, amazingly friendly. You know, instantly everybody was welcoming. You know, nobody was a, nobody was a dick, which is huge, because a lot of people would have you believe you go overseas and everybody's a dick, and that just wasn't the case in my experience. Yeah, yeah. Now we were, you know, after a while you realize like, oh God, we're all in the same boat. Like even the Germans who could easily like get in their car drive four hours and be home for a weekend they would much rather like hang out with us and just you know we'd all get to know each other we'd all go out together and then sooner or later one of them would be like hey you want to come hang out in germany for the weekend sure even you you one friend that was uh from milan even shorter drive home the one that oh, we stayed Paolo. with pa yeah yeah pow pow um <laughs> Shout out to him for for letting us crash at his place when we went there. <laughs> you know what? He always says, you're always welcome to crash. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to take you up on it. <laughs> Even yeah. I'm like... And I'm bringing a guest. But, uh, I mean, that was a that was a nice nice little cherry on top of the trip that last yeah. night. Where did we end up going? I remember I got sick at the end of that trip. I don't remember where. Oh, we... you were, like, deathly ill on the, on the flight home. No, because we, we were flying home from Milan because we couldn't change yeah. it. We couldn't just catch the second leg from Zurich, so we had to take the train. <laughs> we had to take the train from Z Zurich all the way down to Milan. You know what? I with Paolo for that night. I was not upset about that. I was like happy about the train ride because, like, you see, you see, just Switzerland. Well, I always describe that train ride to people when, like, I'm talking about the trip because you could literally see the progression where you're driving, you're on the train going south, you're. You're going through, you know, like the everything has like that Bavarian feel, everything, the German architecture and stuff. And then the closer you get to Italy, as soon as you cross the border, all of a sudden stuff starts to look a little run down. You can well, tell that the guys that were building it kind of were like, ah, you know, fuck it. We're going to go have a smoke. We'll be back. Yeah, as soon as you we'll get, get it yeah, done no, eventually. Ticino, really. As soon as you get to Ticino, you're like, eh, it's becoming a little more Italian. Yeah. Well, Ticino is. You described it as kind of like a mix between German and Italian. So Ticino, Ticino is, is like one, a. It's the one canton of Switzerland that's Italian speaking. But within that, you have, I guess, what I would characterize as northern Ticino with, and southern Ticino. So, like, the capital of the canton of Ticino is a town called Bellinzona, which is very much still Germanic. Ish. Mm -hmm. And there's actually a weird, <laughs> a weird kind of version of the language called Ticinese, which is like this weird mixture of German and Italian. And if you, there's a, I forget what the name of the newspaper was, but there was a Ticinese newspaper and it was like written in Ticinese, like almost a dialect. And it was like this weird German Italian thing. And nobody, nobody would even attempt it. Not the Germans, not the Italians, nobody would bother. And then you had like South Ticino, which is on the other side of the San Bernardino Pass or, or you know, on the other side of the San Gotardo Tunnel. That's where- San, uh, San Gotardo Tunnel, that was now the longest tunnel in the world? Or one of the longest? It- It's gotta it, be, it's top three, right? It was at the time, I think, the longest tunnel in Europe. I think it was like seventeen kilometers, eighteen kilometers. It was it weird. You're you're in. You're looking out the window, and it's just dark. It's like, all right, 
going through time. And there's no end to it. It's yeah. just going. Like listening to music, like four or five songs went by. I'm looking out and I'm like, we're still in the fucking we... tunnel, bro. <laughs> oh, yeah. On the train, we would have gone through the tunnel, wouldn't we? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then, you know, on the other side of that, and like Southern Sushino, you're in the Lugano part of it, which is very much the uh, economic center of Ticino, but it's completely Italian at that point. Like it felt, I mean, it felt like all the, the culture and like the, the warmth of Italy with all the cleanliness and order of like the Swiss and Germans. It was like the very, perfect balance. That's a very good observation. Cause that's, that's what they pride themselves on, except in the month of August. What happens in the month of August? That's when the Germans come down. <laughs> and I, you know how a lot of places want tourists to come because mm -hmm. it you know gives you the kind of economic stimulus that a lot of places might like not in this case <laughs> the one summer session i did there i just remember all the germans and the danes they would come down and their campers and all they would do is just go to their campsite next to the lake or next to like a lake or a river or something. And they would just stay there. They wouldn't go out. They wouldn't go out to bars. They didn't even go to grocery stores. They brought everything with them and just left garbage. Ugh. And you can identify them immediately with like the black socks and sandals. And just like, okay, it's, it's nice. It's nice to have like the heat off of me as the American. <laughs> not common enemy for at least a month so when you were in franklin the you know travel international travel was a a, a main part of that school's uh, curriculum i guess you would say like that was yeah. what their their whole thing was getting out there and experiencing different things and learning about different cultures all around the world so aside from the independent travel, which everyone would do like almost every weekend, there was the, what was called academic travel. And academic travel was a course that was required. So if you went there for four years, you're required to take at least six credits of academic travel. So of four years, six trips, so three semesters academic travel. How many did you take? And oh, I took all. I took all four. Are you kidding? Yeah. All eight. Sorry, all eight. I wasn't even. I wasn't even remotely ever considering skipping an academic travel to do my thesis or whatever. <laughs> Let's do my thesis. I'm here for this. <laughs> um, all the trips would have um, like a a curriculum focus. So, like the communications professor would go to like Paris and Berlin. Um, to teach communications. Um, we had, a, you know, IR professors that would teach us about international organizations or the European Union, whatever was the focus. Like for at least the first two, three trips, you were encouraged to go with whatever the focus of your major was going to be. So I was on the international relations trips for the first three years. And that was your major international relations? Yeah. Um, yeah. So my first trip was Geneva, Brussels, Paris, Strasbourg, oh. and, a stop in, and a stop in Luxembourg, which was interesting. What did you think of Luxembourg? Because my sister Lexi lived there for a while. So she, boring. Yeah, that's pretty much what she said. So boring. Don't get me wrong, like, I'm sure there are things there, but it's boring. It's it's like the Connecticut of here. <laughs> that is the perfect description. It is the Connecticut of Europe. And I'm like, all right, the, the, the only thing you really want with Luxembourg is to say that you've been to Luxembourg. <laughs> the Connecticut um, of Europe. No, no offense. Connecticut. No offense to my friends, the Three Ninjas, the Three Ninjas podcast. Shout them out because they're from Connecticut, but... I mean, oh, yeah, where are they based? Uh, Bridgeport. 
Well, you know, and you're what? you're in Connecticut now too, so I don't have. Yeah, to you can tell them I'm in Hartford, and I hate and blame Connecticut for all the ills of the world. <laughs> I'm gonna cut this up, and I'm gonna send that to them. <laughs> uh, yeah, you can you can feel free, and if if they want to, if they want to invite me down to Bridgeport to show me the joys of the city of broken glass, <laughs> I'm happy to go there. <laughs> so anyway, so. <laughs> Academic travel. Academic travel. <laughs> <laughs> so Geneva, Brussels, Paris, Strasbourg, Luxembourg was my first trip. Um, did Rome and Southern Italy. I don't even know if I'm going in like order here. Doesn't have to. Rome and Southern Italy, Spain and Portugal, Southern Greece and the Cycladic Islands, Northern Greece and Turkey. Uh, Nuremberg, Prague, Bratislava, Budapest. Uh, went back to Russia and Ukraine. I went to the UK, but not for academic travel. And then like, I like towards junior and senior year, I was like, you know what? I'm going to go for the, like the more outrageous trips that are fun. So that was the first time I went to Australia. I did a summer session that took me to Southern Africa. Uh, what part of uh, Southern Africa? Like where it was South Africa? Malawi, Malawi and Zambia. Oh, okay. What uh, was that like? Amazing. I want to go back desperately. It's been <laughs> 10 years since I've set foot on that continent, and I need to again. Kenya, which was, I was supposed to go there, but hey, COVID. <laughs> <laughs> Ironically enough, virtually every country except for Tanzania has shut their borders down to Americans. Like, we're, sh we're shutting the borders down to each other now, so. Good. Yeah. Keep those Florida people down there wheezing for air. Um, easy, easy, sailor. <laughs> I, sh I, sh I share your sentiments, but I have some that live in my home, and I must be kind. Yeah, well. Wear a goddamn mask. You won't be part of my sentence. No, I have the good, I have the good ones here. Uh, let's see. Where the, <laughs> anyway. hell, where the hell else did I? I'm pretty sure that was it. But so, Long story short, I have been to everywhere in Western Europe for academic travel purposes. At the time, everywhere except for Northern Ireland and uh, for Ireland and Scandinavia. Okay. So nothing like the like... by the time I was done with Franklin, everything to the west of Austria I had been to. So you did you ever get to anywhere in Scandinavia, Denmark, Sweden, Finland, anything? At the time, no. Since then now, yeah. now you've been there? Oh yeah. Norway. You went to Norway? For work. Oh. See, now you're you're in the line of work that involves a lot of travel. So I've been to Norway for work and went to Ireland for work as well. Uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about today, now that we've gotten to this point in your life story, mm -hmm. do you recall uh, any particular stories that stand out in your memory during those days of academic travel, You know, getting to experience these different places for the first time, being college age, uh, you know, prime party years for m most of us are we at the embarrassing stories portion of the events not if we don't want to be i don't see how we can avoid it at this point <laughs> <laughs> well just uh, regale us with uh, something that comes to mind because i know i've heard a bunch of these over the years but one of the things that i mean we've been friends for so long so we we were already friends but you know, I feel like as we get older and we our personalities develop and we kind of grow into the people that we eventually become, you know, I've become like I, I've always looked to you like you were you were my smart friend. You know what I mean? Like you you got to, exp <laughs> you know, sorry, sorry, everybody else. No offense. But, you know, you've gotten to experience all this amazing stuff that I've that I wanted to do. And for a long time, I didn't know I wanted to do. So I always enjoyed hearing those stories and hearing your experiences of 
being different places and you know what I mean? Like kind of living vicariously through you. Fair. Um, oh God. I'll tell you what, I'm going to go get more of a refill and then I'll give it some thought. All right. Through the magic of editing, we'll be right back. A so much easier. All right. So we're back. Last, last drink of a, um, uh, I guess we can call it a bottle. It's more of a handle of vodka. So this this one's always this one's always trouble. Okay. Yep. Ooh, yep. that looks like a good one. Yep, it's a great one. <laughs> <laughs> Whew. Okay. So, yeah, we're we're at stories from uh, your your time abroad, your time in My Europe. Time abroad. Broad story. So I do remember there was a story about drinking absinthe. There was. Uh, all right. So I'll, I'll let you pick and choose. Okay. But we can do the when Max turned 21 in Switzerland story. See, or I don't. Know, I might not even know that story. Or we can do the Max turned. Or Max tried absinthe in Budapest, Budapest story. Or we can do one of the numerous Max becomes a de facto member of the Russian mafia story. This is like the Burt Kreischer machine story. Hmm? You're familiar with the comedian Burt Kreischer? I am not. Oh, he had a great story about he went to on a a trip uh, in college to Russia and it's kind of along the same lines where he he <laughs> kind of joined the Russian mob and kind of robbed a train. <laughs> oh, oh, no, I do know this guy then. The guy that with no shirt? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right, how about this? Okay, before before we get into that, we'll make those will be our our embarrassing stories for the night. Okay. What I what I want to ask you about is the value that you found in in your time studying abroad, uh, traveling to different countries, experiencing different cultures, what kind of like real world value has that brought to your life? In a word, invaluable. Because now we're talking to people that maybe, you know, haven't had the opportunity to travel and see these different things. Like you need to, you need to. That is my ultimate advice for people. So I remember, like, even after high school, when I was thinking, I want to travel the world, it was like, these are things I want to do, because most people, especially in the US, they kind of, they use it as their retirement goal, like, when they retire, they're going to travel. I'm like, when you retire, you're not going to be able to go to Rome and walk up the Spanish steps. When you retire, you're not going to be able to experience these cities. You're going to be on these like guided tours, basically following some guy with a little flag telling you <laughs> what to look at and what to look for. Like, there is a lot to just experience on your own. Like, go down that alley that you may not want to go down. Go go to that city that you may not want to necessarily not not, not want, but not necessarily think to go mm-hmm. so you know you yourself can speak to that experience like i said earlier like lugano is not a place that tourists would want to go to but you went there and you experienced for yourself there's nothing to go see in terms of like a tourist attraction no but i mean no i could church but it was a beautiful place and i had a i had an amazing time so while it may not be a tourist attraction in the traditional sense there's no reason why a human being with uh, half a brain in their head wouldn't want to go there and experience it, because it was it was wonderful. The food was some of the best I've ever had. The you know, now this is something I don't know if this is because it was my first trip, you know, to Europe. I do specifically remember that trip, that uh, specifically Lugano. The food there, for some reason, tasted better than anywhere else I've been to. That's counting. Yeah. You know, France and, and Spain and uh, the Netherlands. The, but the food there, even Milan. I mean, we didn't yeah. eat that much when we were in Italy, but the food specifically in Lugano was yeah. the best I've ever had. But 
that's but that's what I'm talking about. Like that is not a nuance that you would necessarily consider where you're when you're in a place like Paris or Madrid or Amsterdam for that matter. You don't know if you're getting like the tourist menu or if you're eating the same food as the locals, but like in Lugano, there's no tourist spots. You're eating the same food as everyone else that lives there. You're experiencing the same thing that everyone else is. Like sitting around the main piazza, just mingling and mixing and being and just sipping on an espresso for three hours. Yeah. Like that's just kind of, I don't want to say lifestyle. I don't want to make it that douchey, but it's just. We are walking that, that fine line between, you know, douchey and experienced. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying it's, <laughs> it's not something that you would experience in the U.S., you know? No, it's definitely not. It, and it's whole... definitely not something that you would experience in your normal day-to-day -day life. Like, like one of the thing, one of the first observations that I made just when thinking about life in the U.S. versus life in Europe is, like, there's no piazza culture here. Like, everything is, we're going to dinner. Great. Two hours. We're going to go order our food as quickly as possible, get our food, eat it, get dessert, maybe have a drink or two, and then leave. Like, you're kind of rushed out of places over there, as you saw. Like, you order your food, you are, you are hovering over yeah. there for hours make, and hours. Make yourself comfortable. You're going to be there for a while. And rightly so, like. Because it's meant to be enjoyable. Like, you're with, yeah. you're out with the people, like. Your, yeah. your neighbors and so to speak it's that's the attract that's the goal is to or not the goal but that's the idea is to be around people and and like you said mingle and i mean that, yeah. that's how you the piazza culture that's the first time i've ever heard it said i didn't realize that was a, a term that people used it's it's a term that i use i have never oh, heard okay. it. say it but i'm just saying fair enough it doesn't need to be a term <laughs> there because everyone knows what it's about. Yeah, they all know what you're talking about. And you've been through Spain. You've been, like uh, most of the places in Europe, like the mm -hmm. piazza, like the place that's lined with all the restaurants and bars and cafes. That's usually sitting right outside the main cathedral of that town. Most of which, especially throughout Western Europe, like non-Germanic, non-UK places, you know, they're all predominantly Catholic. So the whole idea is they'll go to Sunday mass in the morning and in the afternoon, they're, they're spending all day long, just like sitting and hanging out and being with their neighbors. It's just it's not, it's not a thing that happens here. It's really not. And it's, it's kind of like a, it's it's literally a foreign idea to most of us. It, it doesn't actually. I don't think it is that foreign. I think there is an appetite for it, which is why a place like Main Street in Somerville is a thing. It's to some extent like Times Square. You know, you have like these people who are sort of coalescing in these sort of centers to be around other people they don't necessarily understand why okay Just, that's fair uh, i mean it's yeah i mean logistically it's set up very differently you know like yeah it, it no, no, like, much much differently but i'm yeah. just saying there's an appetite for it you know there's i, imagine, I can see that imagine if you become some the mayor of somerville millionaire developer okay and you say, I'm going to buy a lot of land, not, not a lot, like, I mean, a lot of land, <laughs> and you are going to turn it into, like, a bricked piazza where restaurants can open all along the edge, and it's just a place where people can come hang out. It's a place that a farmer's market can set up in the center of, like Union Square in New York, very much a piazza-ish. But I think you're right now. I mean, like taking a step back, looking at this, I think that's kind of why you see that whole resurgence of the the main street of a, of like a small city, a small town, places like Somerville, like you know Red Bank, like uh, Westfield in New Jersey. At least for anybody that's familiar with those places, that's what those are. Those are small cities. You know, yeah. they're friendly to foot traffic. It's you don't if have. You wanna... 
if you want to go really Jersey about it, look at how many beach communities have boardwalks for that very same reason. Yeah. There you go. You have people coalescing around like restaurants, arcades, clubs on the boardwalk. And then you have people coalescing around a beach and like in the middle, there's just a place where people just walk around and be. Why, why did we move away from that here? We Whereas, never had it. The U.S. never had it here. But it, as, for a country founded by people from everywhere else, you would think that that kind of culture... The, ma would, the majority of everywhere else was from Northern Europe. Hmm. When the Southern Touché. Europe started coming in, it was like the 1920s. See, I forget. You know, like, my, I'm, I'm majority Italian, so... We weren't the first people here, you know? Yeah, but even look at the majority Italian places in the U.S. So, for instance, like parts of Philly, majority mm -hmm. Italian places, like all of those places, they have, they try to have like a similar neighborhood, quartiere, kind of feel <laughs> to it in certain parts of Philly. Um, likewise. Shout out, shit. Shout out to James Watts since we're talking about Philly. But anyway, sorry. Hey, love Philly. <laughs> um, likewise, you know, I'm, I'm, sh I'm sure there are plenty of examples throughout Jersey. <laughs> I can't think of any. Jersey Shore. You said the boardwalk. The Green. Morristown. Morristown. Okay. You can, that's it's, that's it's, an Italian city? No, but it it has kind of like that same premise where you have like a centralized location where a lot of shops and stores and restaurants and bars are kind of headquartered around. It's not as convinced. Yeah, because you actually have a road for cars, which is yeah. the, the big difference with a piazza where it's all for... It's just foot, foot traffic. traffic. Pedestrian. Which is, which is what brings me back to like Times Square. Because like once they... Once they shut Broadway down through Times Square, it became like, oh, wait, there are way more people here. Yeah. Well, t I mean, Times not that I am, is... Not that I am ever a fan of Times Square. I hate yeah. it. It is an office of hell, to be sure. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. I'm not uh, I've had my fill of Times Square. Every time we have family coming in to visit. Mr. Wolf. Mr. Wolf. We want to there, the, we go to New York. Oh, okay. He used to work there, man. Never again. He worked in Times Square. Good lord! I feel like I'm I'm at the perfect location. Ninety percent of the jobs I work at are in like Newport and Jersey City. Yeah. Or Hoboken, and it's like it's perfect. I get all the the beautiful views of like the city. I see all Jersey City. I don't have to go through any tunnels to get there. And then I think I can, you, I, can just... I think you need to come to terms with the fact that Manhattan is embracing like its for its own version of manifest destiny and spreading westward into Jersey. It kind of is. I mean, if you, you, I mean, have you been to Jersey City lately? Not lately, but I mean, it, it really even, is. Even when I was last there, I'm like, this is this is looking more like Chelsea than it is anywhere. Yes, in that is a that's a good description. And Hoboken is straight up Hell's Kitchen. It is definitely taking on the Hell's Kitchen vibe. You think so? Oh, when was the last time you were on Tenth Avenue? I mean, I feel like I was just—I was just there last. I mean, it was a year ago, but it's not that long. You just went from just there to a year ago. That's a lot in between. <laughs> Come on, man. Has it really changed that much in a year? Man, yeah, New York. Are you kidding? Yeah, touche. Especially given uh, current events, but anyway. Yeah. Nah. <laughs> yeah. Ah, but I, I was just, this time last year, I was working in Hoboken. Hoboken is straight up Hell's Kitchen. We're trying to be. Okay. So maybe, wrong. maybe, 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 maybe some of it is trying to migrate to. Actually, you know what? Come to think of it, because I'm thinking like the most northern part of Hoboken is what 14th Street. Well, 15th yeah. is where the T building is. That's. That's the that's because that ties because the, the ferry from 14th Street goes directly to like 33rd Street. Mm -hmm. The ferry is on 33rd, which is Midtown. But I don't know. I've always gotten like a Hell's Kitchen vibe from Hoboken, where it was trying to be like New York, but definitely not Midtown. Well, it depends because Hoboken can have a very different vibe depending on where you go. If you're on Washington Ave, that's the main drag. 
Whereas if you go just two streets over, if you're driving down, like, say, Clinton, like, it feels different. And then if you go even further over into, like, like Jackson, like, then, you know, I mean, it's the whole fucking city is only one square mile. Yeah. I, 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 I still get the Hell's Kitchen vibe. Okay, fair I enough. Definitely, like, I don't, I do not get Midtown. No, I, there's no, there's, the, there's not I enough tall buildings. Get, I don't get um, meatpacking. Like it, it's just very reminiscent of Hell's Kitchen for me. Well, the thing with Hoboken is that everything feels so new there. You know, like everything is redone or rebuilt, and there's nothing. Which is Hell's Ki- which is Hell's Kitchen. Uh, so that's why, I mean, I'm going to have to, I can't really argue that much on that one because they've rebuilt everything. There. Everything is brand new. It's either really old and refurbished or it's completely brand new. And they just, like, kept the name. Like, it's, oh, this was the Maxwell House coffee plant. Like, really? Because now it looks like multi-million dollar apartments. That's, like has- that's, that's absolutely Hell's Kitchen. Okay. You'll walk into some, like, you know, crumbling facade, and inside is like some bar that's entirely stainless steel and like <laughs> modernized from Tuesday. Okay. All right. Go, so, you know, embracing the past, guys. <laughs> um, the main thesis of this episode is essentially the value in experiencing things outside of what you're used to namely different countries. You're a perfect person to talk about this because you've had so much experience in so many different places. Fair. So you gave us your 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 <laughs> Yeah. What's the word I'm looking for? I would say your central thesis, I so to speak. It would be just go fucking do it. Travel. If ever you have the chance, do it. Save up your money. Go. It doesn't have to be, you know, a bank breaking expense to go set up a vi- a trip abroad. It's not. I mean, I realize there's some irony in the fact that we're talking about it, you know, now time is being what they are. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, it's... but I'm, I'm, you know, broader perspective, larger life goals. I say, do it now. It's worth it. It changes you. It opens your eyes a little bit. It definitely does. Um, I am living proof of that. Fuck Florida. Fuck going to to Vegas. It's not much more expensive. Oh, you know who else? You know who else? Remember Tommy Doe? Yes. Yeah, he... I know Tommy. Yeah, he once upon a time, like many years ago at this point, he once upon a time just like randomly like wrote on his wall where to go as like a graduation gift to himself. And he listed like all these play, all these things that he wanted to do. And he had all these people, like people who have obviously kept in touch with him over the years, like giving him suggestions. And I'm like, no, no, New Zealand is what you want. <laughs> and he went there and life altering. So get him. on. <laughs> <laughs> We're friends on Facebook. I could reach out to him. Yeah. All right, buddy. So That's listen, we're here. Humble Pie is a part Oof. of the show where we talk about our embarrassing life experiences to remind everyone that nobody's perfect and these things happen to everyone. So, Max, I'm going to tell my story first since we already kind of brought it up earlier in the episode. So as everybody listening and watching... You know, I took a trip with Max. We went back to Lugano. And uh, I guess it was our second night there. Yeah, it was because it was before the boat cruise. But either way, so we had met up with some people. The boat cruise, the whole thing was on a boat. The yeah, I remember event. the boat cruise. It was before It was the night cruise. before? Yes. Because we went to that. Oh, that we club. went to. Chocolate. We went. Chocolat, yeah, okay. Chocolat. This was after we had uh, dinner at my buddy's place. Yes, after I ate uh, uh, more than I don't I think I, <laughs> I have ever eaten in my life. So it was delicious. Come it on. was, like I said, the best food I've had in my life. Um, you know, we went to this this nightclub, which 
Now, at this point, how long have have you been out of school? When we went back there, it's been at least, I mean, it's over so 10 years at that point, right? I graduated from 12 Brent years. No. In so. May 20, 2007. But okay, I went so it was back the following years. year because I had a lot of friends who were graduating that year. But that was so graduated in 2000, May 2007, went back in May 2008. So, anyway. Been back since 2008, so seven years. Been we went to this this nightclub. Somehow, the bouncer remembered you, remembered Max. I was like, I thought I thought you left. <laughs> like the same fucking guy works here. I didn't know this was a career, but so we got in this place. He took us right to the VIP, and uh, you know, it wasn't a huge nightclub in the sense where like you go to Miami or New York City, but it was like a, a smaller place. It was nice. It was, you know, loud music, the whole nine yards. We're drinking champagne. That was what they brought us. They didn't bring us a bottle of vodka. They brought us a bottle of champagne. And if anybody else is familiar with it, but you don't have to, you know, you don't have to drink a lot of champagne for it to, to get a hold of you. And it got a hold of me pretty good that night. So, uh, you know, we were hanging out. There was a, a few girls there, a few girls, uh, Arab girls. And I really didn't know much about Arab culture and uh, well this I learned later on a couple of days later but uh, the one one of the girls that was part of our group I was getting pretty drunk at this point and I decided uh, you know I mean I, I don't think I, I worded this like this in my head but I just said you you should hit on her right now like that would be a good idea I mean I wasn't like <laughs> overly aggressive or like inappropriate but I was hitting on this girl and she was kind of like very, very nice about it. Like, oh, no, 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 no. Like she wasn't feeling it. And I guess it was at some point somebody had told me like, no, 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 bro. She's a, she's a lesbian. She's definitely not into you. <laughs> and I just remember feeling like super embarrassed at that time. And that was, I think that was how I got the idea in my head. I'm like, I should probably get out of here because I don't think I'm going to salvage this night now. <laughs> and that was when I just decided to leave, not having been familiar with the city at all being only my second day there not speaking italian i just kind of remembered okay so when we left the hotel the lake was on our right so if we're walking anywhere i'm gonna put the lake on my left and i'll eventually get there and i got there uh, yeah, I, just, those, I just remember being super embarrassed by those it. were the those were by the way the exact instructions i gave you oh okay go up the stairs just go straight <laughs> turn right because you'll be at the lake Just Congra congratulations follow. max you are now the voice in my head <laughs> after all these years yeah but yeah nothing to be embarrassed about i promise you you are hardly the first franklin related person to try and hit on arab girls mm. i tried a different girl the following night and that was when you Oh were god, who did you try the following night? I don't I don't I don't recall the girl's name. She was very nice, very pretty, but that was when you kind of pulled me aside like, listen dude, you're you're barking up the wrong tree. <laughs> <laughs> oh god. I mean, hey, you wanted to have your European adventure. I just, you know, I was like <sighs> Not my friends because of thing X Y and Z. Uh. That energy, that energy is better spent elsewhere. Correct. All right. So, uh, what, what club were we at the second? Oh, the casino. That was the casino. Yeah, that was at, that was we were all in our suits and everything. That was after God. the actual alumni event. I hated that place. Yeah, it wasn't really Claudia. Nice you either. were after Claudia. Is that what her name was? I don't know. Yep. Anyway, I'm a married man now, so. Yeah, let's not tug at that thread because <laughs> <laughs> that's a whole other episode right there. Yeah, one best not ever aired or discussed in any way, shape, or form. Let's just take it all to our graves. We don't we don't talk about marriage in front of Max. We do not. Okay, buddy, it's your turn. Which one do you want? So, what, what were the options again? The Budapest absinthe and the what else? Budapest and absinthe, um, being a de facto member of Russian mafia. Let's hear the Russian mafia one. 
Wait. Is that I've, the third one? I forgot what was the third one. I don't. Are you the only? Twenty first birthday. <laughs> okay. I, I want to hear the Russian mafia one, but then we might have to hear the twenty first birthday one. Just like you know what? I'm perfectly happy. I'm I'm perfectly happy to go through all three at this point. <laughs> really, they're just. Part of we're, we're we're actually kind of running up on uh, on time, so uh, we got about fifteen minutes left. All right. So, Russian mafia. Yeah, let's hear it. Okay. Because I've already decided I'm going to call this episode Russian roulette, just because. <laughs> <laughs> Even though we didn't talk about it at all. So. Um, at the time that I was at Franklin, what I hadn't realized when I had gotten there was that the Russian mafia was very well established for having their banking done in Lugano. So basically, all the Arabs had their banking done in Geneva. All the Russians had their banking done in Lugano. And various other nefarious organizations, including many in the U.S., had their banking done in Zurich. But the Russians were very clearly in Lugano. Um, and after a while, I noticed that my ability to speak Russian basically got me a lot of perks. <laughs> so, um, got me into clubs and got me free drinks, whatever. And then one of my friends at one point was hitting on some Russian girls and <laughs> I clearly saw what was happening. And one of the guys that came up behind him that had an issue with or with him hitting on these Russian girls was clearly was the fact that he one of them was her husband. Um, very common amongst the Russian mafia, you know, having one or multiple wives. <laughs> So I basically, I, I pulled a cartoonish, like, getting up underneath and in between the two of them to basically stop these three guys from killing my friend. And then during that incident, I started speaking to them in Russian, trying to explain to them very cordially, very nicely that my friend is drunk. He has no idea what he's doing. He's an idiot. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I found myself being flanked by like three or four guys who I guess thought that because I wasn't part of their Russian mafia, I was part of their Russian mafia. <laughs> and next thing I know, I have backup. <laughs> and so I separate the situation. I get my friend the hell out of there. 20 minutes or so go by, you know, we're still having fun. We're still doing whatever. Like, obviously, and we're with the Franklin kids. So we're like, all right, clearly nothing else is going to happen. Um, my newfound Russian mafia guys, they find me. They just drag me to their table and they shove a bottle of vodka down my mouth just so I can drink as much of it as I can. Mind you, at this point, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm seeing they, they're pretty sure they had firearms. So I'm like... <laughs> I am not going to finish drinking this bottle of vodka. Next thing I know, I'm like, okay, too much, too much. Blackout. <laughs> Just blacked out with a bunch of Russian guys hovering around me, screaming at me in Russian. Thinking that for some reason that I arrived late to the table. So they kept saying penalty in Russian, which is stuff, which is instead of drinking like just one shot of vodka, you drink like double, triple yeah, shot. Yeah, make up for lost time. Yeah. Um, I don't know how much of the bottle went down me like within those three minutes, but I definitely remember having a great time for about a minute <laughs> and then just waking up the next morning naked, walked <laughs> out, and then just my friends showing pictures the next day. Oh, boy. I'm like, I had a great time. <laughs> I mean, it's more, of a, it's more of an embarrassing story because I don't know what the hell happened. But uh. 
tell a, tell a story of like, I'm a guy that had a great time. I saved my friend. I joined the Russian mafia. But otherwise... It could be, it could be anything. You both had a great time and a terrible time. It's Schrodinger's yeah, cat. It's the Schrodinger's I'm, cat of exactly, stories. Exactly. <laughs> we, can, we can call it the Schrodinger's cat. I'm just waiting for like an email or something. Like, yeah. That is on. Return to Lugano to fulfill the cause. <laughs> like, sons of bitches. All right. Uh, give us a, the quick uh, Cliff Notes version of the 21st birthday story. 21st birthday story. Turned 21 in Switzerland. Of course, we were all drinking well before that, so 21 didn't mean anything. We just kind of turned it into a thing to <laughs> kind of turn it into a thing. Um, two of my friends, Pinar and Petra, they decided that they were going to stage a kidnapping and take me somewhere to celebrate my birthday. Little did I know that they had set up everyone who was there. This was a summer session. All of my friends who were there as like a massive party on the lawn at one of the residences. They bring me there. They bring me to like this like edge to, for me to see everyone who was there. My friend Hanar, she pops the trunk of her car and shows me a massive bottle of Bailey's and a massive bottle of vodka as my gifts. So this was around like 10 p.m. that the party started. I get it in my head for some reason, again, turning 21, that I should finish the bottle of vodka by myself before going out to the pub and going uh, out the pub, the same pub we went to. The bottle of vodka is the pregame. Yes. Um, and I'm like, I'm going to do it. <laughs> did it got to the pub and of course the pub knows all of us so the pub fully aware and in on the fact that it was my birthday they decided to uh, embrace the american tradition of doing 21 shots and 22 shots because you need one for luck <laughs> at that point for some reason i was in an, in enough sense to say I'm, I'm gonna distribute these to my friends to do with me never mind the fact that i'm still doing like five or eight shots on my own i take the final good luck shot blackout i come to at the club downtown where my friend hanouf she was taking care of me that night she was the designated babysitter for me <laughs> I come to at the club where I'm dancing with these two girls who I'd never met before. And I'm like, huh. I go to my friend Hanouf and I'm like, am I having a good time? <laughs> she just like grabs me and she's like, yes, you're having a great time. And then just like pushes me away. I'm like, great, blackout. Wake up the next morning in my in my room, have, having no idea of what happened. <laughs> a lot of stories end that way, come to think of it. Um, There's no pattern or up, anything there. Wake up in my bed, completely naked, no idea what happened the night before. Sounds like the story before. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say, I'm like, I really didn't think about how these stories end. <laughs> They're just the same. Um, not really being able to move, I kind of like roll myself off of the bed and just plop onto the floor <laughs> and I kind of like pull myself to the refrigerator because I knew for sure I had at least one bottle of water in there I open it up there is a bottle of water in there along with a cup of yogurt for some reason and a bottle of Johnny Walker Blue <laughs> like I don't know how any of this happened and then the same two friends who had kidnapped me for my birthday come to my door. And they're like, we're, we're here to take you to get food. <laughs> they bring me to the grotto. And everyone who was at the party, they just like know what was, know exactly what's going on. And I sit there for like six hours and everyone like spends the day bringing me like sandwiches and coffee. <laughs> like, we'll get she sounds wonderful. We'll get you better, Max. <laughs> just like wearing sunglasses the whole time because <laughs> it is easily the most hungover I have ever been in my life. 
and then that's when everyone starts bringing out the pictures of me uh. dancing with girls and me, dan me dancing with quite, quite a few guys, really, from Lugano. <laughs> Having a great time. I'm like, hmm. So they're out there somewhere. I can never run for public office. <laughs> I don't think I don't think we have to worry about that, Max. Oh, I don't think I have to worry about that. <laughs> All right. So before we go, I just want to say thank you so much for coming on and talking to me tonight, even though, you know, this is not really much different from a normal conversation we would have. I did get to Which, learn a little bit a little bit more about you that I'm surprised I didn't already know, but uh No, you know what though? You were a perfect person to talk about this particular topic because this is something I wanted to really kind of touch on again. We touched on it briefly uh, on an episode I did with, with Lexi, my sister. So having you on here was the other half of that conversation. Uh, but overall, you're one, of my, you're one of my best friends, have been for a long time. I love you, brother, and I really appreciate you taking the time to do this tonight. Love you too, buddy. And listen to... To those listening, to those who will listen, times are tough. Times are not great for travel, but everyone should use this time to figure out their place. You know, Steve, you had your place, and that place was Zurich, a place you were complete. You like you were what? I might have to change it. No, no, no. You can't change it. I'm just saying. Oh, like that was the place I wanted to go. Ah. Everyone has a place gotcha. initially, and then they they get there, and then there's another place. Gotcha. Like everyone has their that, place that they that want to bucket go list place. Not even a bucket list place, just a place that like calls to them, like that draws them that they may not otherwise, in any way, shape, or form, know anything about, and for any reason, really. And you know, that's a place to start. That is always going to be your place. So. You know, whenever, if ever, life returns to some semblance of normalcy, and it will, make that something that you do. Not make a, a priority. Not a, not a goal, not a bucket list, not the, that's where, that's the first place I'm going to go to when I retire. You know, two, three, five years, make it the place that you go to. I know for a lot of people that's difficult, especially, you know, most people our age, they're, you know, marrying and breeding and buying houses and all sorts of. Even, even given all the, all those circumstances, it's not that difficult. It's not that expensive. You know, I mean, uh, I get it. If you, you know, a lot of us, a lot of people listening, we have kids, we have families. It's not always easy to get away from them. You know, maybe, I mean, you don't necessarily want to get away from them, but you know what I mean? Like, it's not easy to get a little time to go do something for you, but there's no excuses in terms of, oh, I really can't afford it right now. It's not that bad. It's not that hard. You know, I get it. We all have bills. I got bills. Vax, you have bills. We all have bills. It's not going to break the bank. As long as you plan it properly, it's, it's very, very doable. So you can, like... There's no monetary value that you can assign to a trip that will be worth more than your ability to enjoy it now in your youth while you can. I mean, that's true. You know, probably how many, how many people like would listen who you've known since high school, like ask them. It's been a, it's been a long time, but how fast has it flown by? Mm. Been I'm, like, seventeen I just, years. The year of my graduation from Franklin, we my family came out to see my me graduating, and I just remember they wanted to go to Rome very badly. So of course I arranged it for us to go to Rome, have a place to stay, blah blah blah. And I just remember we were at Spanish Steps, and there was like a bus full of tourists. Americans, to be sure, piling out of this bus, all of them in like, you know, sweatsuits with fanny packs and walkers. And I'm like, 
all right, these people are just going to like stand around the piazza. They're going to look around here, look around there. They'll, they'll maybe walk to like um, Trevi Fountain, but they don't have the option to walk up the Spanish steps and go to the church if they want. They don't have the option of just, you know, taking a walk around, maybe going to some of the little side cafes that are just really amazing. Just, just fucking like, off and doing what they feel like doing. Yeah, exactly. Like at some point you start being limited by your abilities and you really don't want to do that. Like you want to experience it the way you want to experience it. And, you know, for those of you who want, for those who want to, you know, just do guided tours and tour groups for your life, that nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying there's a lot more to see. And for those of you who do want to fuck off, then, you know, go now whilst you have the ability yeah. to fuck off. I second that. It's worth it. It's worth it. very worth it. This is an entire second episode worth of us telling you, go fucking do it. So I feel like I owe you a second episode, so you just tell me when, buddy. Oh, no, I'm saying this is the second episode we've done. Just talking, I mean, I've done just talking about why people should get the fuck out of in their hometown. But we can 100% do a second episode. That goes without saying, doesn't, sir. Doesn't need to be that far. Even Canada. Go to Montreal. Get that European feel. Six hours drive. That's Not true. It's, I mean, it, it doesn't feel like the U.S. Go to Quebec. <sighs> Lots of options. Lots of options. Just all you need to do is look. You'll find it very quickly. Exactly. All right. So, Max, again, thank you very much, brother. It's been a pleasure. This is you and Rob now have the, the two longest episodes I've ever done. Ooh, how long is this one now? Over two hours. Really? Oh, yeah. yeah. Started at two. So, well, drinks breaks might might count. Yeah, again. that'll that'll cut it down, but it's still it's still up there. But it was a good one, man. I enjoyed it. It was fun. Good stuff. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, any any last words before we get out of here, Max? I need another drink. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there you have it. That was my interview with Max B. Uh, big shout out to Max. Big thank you to him for coming on and being so generous with his time. Even though I know he's not really doing much else. You know, he's quarantined just like most of us. But uh, <laughs> now nah, Max is one of my oldest friends. And, uh, you know, I'm really happy to finally get to have him on here. And I hope you guys enjoyed it because it was kind of us just bullshitting a little bit. But uh, as always, you guys know where to find us, uh, apodamongsmen at gmail.com for any questions, comments, concerns, suggestions, whatever the hell you got. Uh, or on Instagram and Twitter at apodamongstmen. If you want to DM me or whatever or follow me, like some of the, the memes I make and all that good stuff. And if you're watching this, you already know that we have a YouTube channel. Please subscribe, like, and comment and all that stuff. And if you want to listen, you can download the podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, Spotify, SoundCloud, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, and everywhere else. Excuse me. So, that's it. Uh, we'll see you next week. Peace.